Thank you for tuning into Stampscape's YouTube, <laughs> the channel. I just did this scene right here of using a, a couple of my, I don't know, stamps out of my private collection. One is from Onion Arts right here, and these two hands right here are from Gumbo Graphics. I'm kind of utilizing those within this scene in this format right here. It can really show you some, uh, you know, the differences, you know, a couple stamps can make in a scene. You know, instead of having, you know, a bunch of trees or pine trees here, you know, scene. Adding these things in here really can change the, uh, alter the, uh, kind of the theme and the entire concept or look of your scene. And then I added, um, some circles in here using a compass with a universal adapter and a gel pen but you know i mean it really gives a different type of uh kind of theme to this technique here but you know you can really utilize any of these techniques that i've shown these videos for in different in the work that you're doing um, just by altering it, I, I mentioned in the video, I mean, if I didn't have these hands or this figure in here and I left the area in there, you can put a quote stamp in there, you know, and talk about stars or something of that sort. But, um, anyway, so this is, a uh, kind of a version of a scene that I did quite a few years ago using, uh, those two hands right here and that figure kind of, you know, kind of on its side there, kind of giving it this idea of, a, I don't know, the formation of it or whatnot. And, I don't know, it's fun stuff playing around with uh, kind of themes like that, or just different um, stamps in your collection that you might not kind of associate with um, scenic stamps, but just to show you that anything can be used with, you know, stamps that could be used as backgrounds, which are um, kind of any kind of scenic stamps, and especially sky. If you choose to watch the video, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks, as always, for tuning into the Stampscapes channel. Okay, quite a few years ago I did a scene that I titled Levitation, and it was just, I had my Onion Arts um, figure here. They were a company out of New Mexico. I think they were, you know, or a, a, a sideline of uh, Imagine Air designs, and if you've been stamping a long time, you might recognize the name Imagine Air. They did a lot of... Um, very detailed, uh, accurate um, renderings of various um, aircraft. But, I don't know, I, I bought this from them and uh, I really liked some of Onion Arts um, designs and uh, all I did was I placed the figure kind of like this in uh, that scene and I placed my two hands here from um, 100 proof press. It's P813 and 814 if you're interested. Their 100 proof press is still around. And I put those two hands down here and uh, I don't know, I did some kind of morphic uh, things with uh, the imagery. And I don't know, it was, it was a fairly um, simple composition, but um, I thought it looked kind of neat. And uh, I always like using my my images from um, my, you know, private collection of uh, stamps that I've amassed over the years. I haven't bought as many stamps um, in recent years. Uh, a lot of the companies that, that I used to like are kind of gone now, so I've been, I don't know, I, I buy them sometimes if, uh, you know, like a if I'm in some store somewhere, you know, like a Viva Las Vegas, and they happen to have, uh, you know, some of these companies that um, are no longer around, or, or they did at one time. Uh, this was quite some years ago, but um, um, let's just add some of these clouds. This is a Stampscape's Cloud Cumulus stamp, okay? And I wiped off the perimeter of this quite a bit, so I'll ink it up just with black ink, and I'm wiping off the edges because I'm going to incorporate, you know, these different images in the form of these hands and this figure in here. And uh, I want the edges to be softer, so, you know, if you want them to be nice and soft and blend in very easily without obscuring 
kind of the silhouette, you know, the shape of these figures, if they're going to be stamped in the same color, then you just kind of wipe it off so that it stamps out more gray around the perimeter than black. Okay, you can see the interior is darker uh, in these images. There, first of all, there's more dots, but there are quite a few dots up here, but I've wiped off a lot of it, so it's, you know, the ink on the stamp is drier. I think I have a video, um, you know, just kind of dedicated to that aspect of it. Um, I think the Sky um, lesson, one of the first I don't know, two or three lessons that I've uh, did for this channel. Okay, let's see. Let's go about right here. We'll have a figure right here, okay. Let's have some lighter versions of the clouds in the background as well, so maybe I'll go for some secondary impressions in here. A lot of times I would um, re-ink it and just blot it off more before I go in here, but I don't know, this is going to be kind of you know, obscured, but I guess I'm going to have the figure right over the top of it, so I'm not really worried about that. Okay, let's keep this going here. I thought I would... This is a half-page piece of paper, too, so it's a little bit larger than what I usually work with. Okay. So I have a lot of area to fill in, and I thought I would do some kind of sky up in the... Uh, upper portion of this. Let's see, this figure will go right around in here, so let's really wipe this bottom part off quite a bit, so this kind of fades out into that area like that, okay? So I'm kind of doing two layers here. And take off quite a bit. Do it with a dry paper towel too, not a not a wet one. A wet one will take off all the ink. You just want to uh, remove um, some of the ink. Or, in, you know, in the case of the, the very bottom of this design, I want to, you know, remove most of it. Okay, but not all. Now, I could, I could do this in color, too. I'm just... This is a large scene. I don't want to uh, take too much time to, uh, you know, work on the compositional part of it. I just want to kind of get it down and, you know, get into the coloring and whatnot. <laughs> I really like, um, if you've watched some of these videos before, you probably get the, uh, the, uh, the idea that I really like adding in those little details in my scenes, and, and I really do. In this one, I'm thinking I'll, I'll use my compass, which I haven't used in a long time, along with my, you know, various colors of gel pens, maybe. I don't know. May, maybe I'll even go with, like, a, a metallic gel pen, and I'll add some kinds of embellishments in here. It, it's kind of... It, it fits this type of uh, scene very well to have um, kind of layers of a... Uh, I don't know. Not meaning, but... Um, I don't know. It did, uh imagery in the form of, I don't know, kind of a non-landscape based um, detail. And I'll show you what I, you know, do when I mean when I get to that. All right, this is the um, Milky Way stamp right here. It's fairly large. Let's do use some color on this one, though. Let's, let's you know, the, the scene is going to have color, but um, I didn't bother with the, the clouds. I just wanted to get that down. Okay, let's do a little mixing here. Um, <clears throat> I've done this, you know, fairly recently, you know, a month ago or so. The, the violet tones. Let's, let's go with something a little bit different. Let's go with... I just happen to have these two pens. I don't have a lot of pens on my desk here, but... Here's an orange. Um, this one's the brilliant yellow. I don't even know if these are working. Let me check if these are working. I might need to re-ink these. No, nope, that one looks pretty good. That's an orange. Here's a dark brown. And this is the brilliant yellow. Okay, no problem. These are really old pens. These are probably... I don't even know. The, you know, the, the latest pens um, from Marvy, which changed... <clears throat> I don't know, 15 years ago, or probably... 
they have this black barrel on them, generic barrel, instead of the whole, you know, thing being one color. Um, and that was from years ago, so I have no idea how old these pens are. These could be, I don't know, 20 years old, even. Okay, I'm just going, you can tell I'm not being that, you know, careful about kind of a my placement of that. I go brown, and then I'll go with the, this orange and just kind of color this. And these are, these are dye-based inks here. These are, you know, watercolor pens, okay? So it's not drying too fast. If I'm out in Arizona or something like that, and it's, you know, midsummer or something like that, then, uh, you know, you might want to I don't know, move a little bit faster. I don't feel compelled, you know, or, you know, to have to do that. But, you know, don't take forever doing this either. Okay. These, uh, Marvy pens are pretty juicy. Okay, now I just, I did go from dark to light. Yeah, it gets on my thing here, but I just do a couple, you know, little strokes like that, and it's clean again, you know. I don't need to worry about that color polluting anything else. All right, let's go in with this orange here. Or, uh, brilliant yellow, sorry. And I'm going basically into my orange. I'm kind of doing this kind of motion. I'm kind of pulling, too, you know, to kind of pull some ink off. So if I just go like this, it's just going to mix, and I might not be able to see any kind of effects of using this color. So I kind of have to kind of remove a little bit, too if I want, um, you know, some stronger variation happening. Okay, I think that looks good. Let's take this and wipe off a little bit of the edge to blot it off. I'm going probably a in half inch to an inch into the scene or so. Uh, the, not scene, but the, the stamp. Okay, uh, I don't know probably don't need to mask, but I'll mask off my clad slightly. I'll just, I'm just taking a red paper towel. Yeah, let's go. There's no real up and down to this stamp, but I'll go about like so. It's not going to fill in that whole space, so I'll go for a couple extra impressions, or I could run some more cloud around it. Either way. Or you can do both, okay? All right. There we go. Kind of a real earthy sky, isn't it? All right, let's go for another impression or two here. And go with the orange. I kind of go into those um, brown strokes just to uh, really blend out those colors, otherwise I'll get kind of this harsh, you know, marker, you know, which there is in here, but a lot of the other parts are kind of blended in a little bit more. people ask, well, how did you get that star in there or something like that when they see the final result, thinking that it's somewhat of an additive process, but these stamps are designed, um, sky imagery especially, are designed to, nah, I'm not going to bother wiping this one off. They're designed to show the reverse um, um, image of what you're going for, okay? So if there's a moon, it's, you know, a light moon and a darker sky because the perimeter around it has been defined. So you'll always kind of uh, baffle your friends and family, <laughs> whoever you give your scenes to if you give them away. You always say, how did you get that, you know, or how did you get that cloud light, you know? or something like that. They think you've done some sort of uh, remo color removal technique on an otherwise dark card. Because that's how a lot of um, other images are made out there in the stamping world, but these ones are the reversed. 
So if it's a bolt of lightning, you know, the image is the negative space around that bolt. It's not the bolt itself, okay? Which is always the case before, uh, you know, I started doing these designs back in for a stamp the hand company. I always thought, well, the stars really should be, you know, light, you know, not, not dark. Okay, so, by the way, this is tack and peel on my acrylic block. Just put the plastic back over it, and it's ready to go for the next unmounted stamp, if you use unmounted stamps. All right, that looks really weird, doesn't it? It's because all these different types of colors will be blended into the scene, and it'll give it that color scheme um, that's defined by our light source up here. It's not really a light source, you know, you have starlight shining down, but it is the color scheme of the scene. So it will, in a sense, become our light source for this um, instance or situation, composition, whatever you call it. Okay, let's start adding in our kind of subject imagery. Imaginaire designs and uh, onion arts. They used to cut these blocks specific to the size, and then they would take a sander and they would, you know, kind of round out all eight, I guess, twelve bevels of the wood. So quite a, quite a endeavor uh, as far as the craftsmanship of their and construction of their stamps. It's very kind of handmade feeling, you know, which in a good, very good way. And, uh, I don't know. I didn't really think about it too much back then, but in the years since them, they kind of lacquered the sides of the, uh, the wood, too. You know, I'm sure they stamped this on here, and then they sealed it in with a, you know, a, uh, somewhat of a, I don't know, a polyurethane or something. I don't know if it was a spray or if they, you know, painted it on. <laughs> In other words, labor-intensive. Yeah, that's what I really like about um, wood-mounted stamps. I don't like the storage aspect of them, you know, and how much room they take up, but um, yeah, I love them as far as a kind of a handmade product. Okay, let's see. I'll put these hands like so. Kind of, if it was really the back side of the hand, might have been more kind of appropriate, but <clears throat> I don't have that those images, so not like these, the left and right. So I'm just doing this. I don't know if I ordered these directly from a hundred proof press, probably, or if I got them like at Stampa Barbara, Stampin Barbara. Um, I remember their. Uh, shelves they used to organize by category, not by, you know, company. With my stamps, they organized by company because all my stamps were kind of nature, so they put all my stuff together. Um, you know, they didn't, they didn't put rocks over there and trees over in another category, but hands like this in Stampa Barber used to be uh, in a category called body parts, which included eyes and, you know, Mouths, every you know, everything like that. It was always kind of cool to see. All right, so there we have our kind of really weird looking, I know, um, composition right here. And uh, we'll bring it, try to bring it all together with the use of color now. Uh oh, I do think it's probably time that uh, yeah, I might be able to get away without it. I was going to say. Um, clean off my uh, stylus tool tips. I have about 10 wands, and it, inevitably they all kind of turn to black after a while, but um, and I just wash them all at one time. It doesn't take very long. I just put them in the sink and you know, kind of dab them out, but I don't know. When I get stinking, I don't feel like, st I don't feel like stopping and uh, cleaning. My pieces, although I do love it when I, you know, everything is all cleaned up and 
set to go and ready. I do appreciate it. I'm not someone that likes living in a pile of uh, <clears throat> stuff and is more comfortable with that. All right, so let's work in a range of brown hue, okay? So I'm going to start off with this mustard seed, um, yellow distress, and I'll try to maybe the tea dye walnut stain. The tea dye might be really light, you know, and might not even show up very much at all. Okay, so I'm going to use um, a range of colors, okay? Now here's the thing that makes color application and color themes easy to do and I don't talk about this in every video I I use the uh, the process in every video but one of the things that I used to do uh, for my class is what I with whatever color scheme someone wanted to do someone would say I would work them through everything you know a first scene doing all blues I would say okay grab that light blue you know salvia blue grab your number 10 and then go to your number three that was the you know, the colors in the Marvy brand pads because that's what I use in my workshops, okay? But basically, I have people grab their pads and go from light to dark within some given color scheme. And believe me, it really makes it a lot easier if you do that and make this entire process visual, okay? So if I was going to do some grass or something like that, I would say... This is where, where it differs a little bit from a lot of times what people are doing um, in their other types of stamping. If something's green, they might use, okay, I want to use that green right there. That'll be perfect for that object or something like that. And they'll use that. But what I'm doing is I'm kind of working through a range of hue and dye-based inks are transparent. This is what gives kind of the end result kind of a nice deep saturated glowing um, appearance is if you use multiple values maybe temperatures too like this is a little bit of a warmer green to kind of more of a neutral green right here but if you just it doesn't mean you have to have real specifics I you know I would suggest people mix and match okay with whatever you have a lot of times people have like two or three lines of pads that they have mementos distress stampin up etc okay but just line things up you know uh, grab them eh, you know it if you're worried about kind of getting them all out of order and you know you'd rather go one at a time you could but just you know keep in mind um, the range of values and if you can't tell if they go together you just kind of you know put them next to each other and if it looks like it blends okay it's a nice transition, then it'll work fine on the paper. Now here's the thing, let's say I don't have those colors right here. This is a bigger jump in value from something very light to something very dark, okay? It'll still work, but it won't have the, the depth, the potential depth of a range of tones like this. Now I'm not using greens in this one, I'm just saying that for an example right here, but just lining things up, you can even mix and match pens or something like that, you know? If I don't have this brown, then the walnut stain right here would probably just work just fine, okay? All right, that being said, let's start off with the lightest color, okay? Now, this yellow is going to be a little bit infected, and after much of my talk on kind of having a range, you know, this brown will, prob or, you know, this brown will probably show up a little bit in this yellow. Yeah, not too bad, okay? You can use any kind of sponge applicator. Let's see if I have some of my oh cosmetic sponges. This one has green on it here. Here's some. Oh, maybe it'll work just fine. It looks kind of dry. See, this is a cosmetic sponge, right? So you don't need you know the stylus tools. The stylus tools are really nice, though they're very comfortable in my hand. But you know, you can do this. I mean, we've done it before. Um, you know, going way back. You know, with you know, wadded up paper towel, but all right, now here's the thing. If you want certain areas to remain nice and light, to like make it look like there's light on it, don't color everything out, okay? All right, now I'm just using this cosmetic sponge just as an example. It has a little bit of green in it too, which I don't necessarily want right here, eh, but it's still fine. All right, but this is just to show you that you can do something like this, okay? And if you're working on kind of matte paper, you know, it's not going to look quite a, you know, it's not going to look glossy like glossy cardstock, but you can do it. You just 
layer on a little bit more color, okay? So is this hard? Well, it's hard if you're kind of really used to doing things where you're staying within the lines. And it's not hard as far as a technique, but it's hard just in terms of a concept of breaking a, you know, a habit that you're kind of used to. But believe me, it doesn't take long to uh, kind of get into the, uh, you know, the, you know, the scheme of it, the whole kind of idea of it. And yeah, I would see it all the time. You know, people were kind of uncomfortable, kind of just going through and, uh, you know, coloring, <laughs> breaking outside the lines, and not having real definitive areas to uh, fill in. But here's what I'm doing. I'm just kind of leaving some areas a little bit lighter, like in my clouds up here. Um, going in this lighting is just a matter of the retention of the lighter areas of your objects and where you leave those lighter is all up to you okay so I'm just going in here and oscillating it a little bit coming into it and like see this figure right here this figure I want to keep somewhat illuminated it's kind of the you know the subject of my scene same with the hands down here so I might not come into those hands too much with color. Okay, I might come into it a little bit. I don't. Sometimes I don't want it just stark white. So I'll come into it a little bit like this. But I want those hands to kind of stand out for me. So I'm kind of adding some color around it. Okay, so see, some clouds are a little bit lighter area around the figure is a little bit lighter and some areas in the sky are a little bit lighter than the surrounding area which is I'm making darker okay and there's no like I said there's no kind of set area you just have to oscillate it and just choose you know what you want to remain light and it doesn't have to be there there aren't definitive areas like or things better it's just better to leave something you know somewhere for me, if I know I'm going to use some kind of figure in there, like a person or the person's in my composition, I usually kind of spotlight it. I just don't tone them out all the way just so we can see them. All right, now let's switch up. Let's use the <clears throat> brilliant yellow. This is the same brilliant yellow that I used in the, uh, you know, to color, you know, in pen form, my Milky Way up here, okay? And it's just a little bit darker. And I'm just going right over the top, okay? Of basically what I did before. All right, I might have to pause this video. I got the, uh, the gardeners are outside and it's going to get a little bit loud. I don't want to stop though. Oh well, I think I'm going to have to. Okay, this is too much fun. Let me get a little bit more down before they're right outside of the window here. Okay, so remember, you know, just retain those lighter areas. And if you decide later on, hey, I should have, you know, added some color into those lighter areas, there's no point in time when you can't go back in with a lighter color and introduce that back over the, right over the top of, you know, some darker ones. If you want to get, you know, those clouds right there are too white, then, you know, go back in and add some of your lighter tones in here. You might want to, you know, clean off your applicator first, but... All right, so anyways, let me add this on one side of the scene. And we can see if we can see any difference, you know, from one side to the next. It's just slightly darker, isn't it? So we're just taking things incrementally darker. It's not like some big jump in value, okay? It makes it easier because, you know, you can kind of use a haphazard, you know, technique, right? And it's not hard. It's not leaving oval shapes everywhere and it's all due to the amount of ink that you're using and you want to use a lot of it okay it makes it so much brighter and easier to apply your inks and that's another thing that's a little bit different um, we're used to doing coverage okay um, once you color something out then it's colored but what I'm doing right here with this ink is I'm saturating the page a little bit more especially with those first couple colors and what that does is it makes it easier for these other colors to 
blend into our scene, the darker ones, okay? The darker ones can leave, potentially leave a mark that's a little bit more obtrusive, unintentional. We don't want to have a big mark like that, oval shape sitting in here, okay? If your page is fairly dry, like that is not going to blend out very easy. But on a wet piece of paper like this, I can put that and see it blends right in. All right, so it just makes it easier and it makes it more saturated and you can kind of see this glowing type of, uh, you know, look starting to develop here. This is the Walnut Stain Distress Ink. It's a nice earthy brown tone. This one, nice kind of aged um, kind of hues, you know, tints of uh, the Distress Liner are really nice to use. Kind of putting some right around my hand here. See if I kind of add that a little bit over the, t you know, over the top of that right there. It makes that hand stand out a little bit more by making something around it a little bit darker. Okay. Now, one of the things that um, I usually do, maybe not so much with this ink so far, but, you know, the, uh, the darker you go, you just don't take it in quite as far, okay? That way we don't have just some area that's you know, completely dark right here, and then light. It's kind of transitioning from darker to lighter, okay? Because there's more ink on the outside, and there's less in here because I'm starting on the outside and working my way in. But it's also because the darker colors are kind of more perimeter-oriented, okay? So you're not going to have to use, you know, the amount of ink that you used on your, you know, first color with every color that you've, you know, kind of laid out for yourself to use. All right. Same thing out here. You can see I'm kind of being more, a little bit more perimeter oriented. If you're using a cosmetic sponge, you know, just kind of come in here like so. Blend it around a little bit. Okay. Or if you're using a... If anyone's using a paper towel, wadded up paper towel, awesome job. That's what we used to use when we used to have to do some sponging, you know. There were people getting like those Nerf balls and things like that and adding, uh, you know, color to their scenes like that back in the day before any accessories were really out and kind of catering to the, uh, the paper crafter stamper. I don't know if there's more companies, stamp companies now than there were at the time, but there were a lot less accessories back then. But there were, might have been more companies, stamp companies around at the time, though I'm not sure. Okay, so that's kind of the same process, right? All right, one of my favorite colors is the number six, Marvy Brown. They don't make Marvy pads anymore, but they do make their re-inkers, and it's a Really fantastic brown. It's a very rich, warm, intense brown. You can see how dark it kind of got, even though it's, you know, fairly light in value. It's only like a medium um, value, probably like a 50%. But Marvy inks are a little bit more th they're thinner, okay, than um, most other inks out there on the market, just in terms of their viscosity. So it absorbs into the paper very nicely, you know, through these other saturations. Sometimes it's kind of hard to get things a little bit darker after we've added, you know, quite a bit of color into the scene and the color thing is kind of layered on here. So sometimes it's trying to like add wet into wet, it just doesn't stick, but the Marvy ones are thinner in viscosity so they soak in, so these are available in various websites out there. You might even find some older ones, but the Uchida website itself has it, the company website that um, sells these. I need to go on there, and they also have blank pads too, but you can also just get the reinker and you know, squeeze it into a little palette or top like that and get it and just go on with that, you know? Especially if you aren't planning on using a given color to stamp stamp impressions, then why not just get the reinker, you know, and use that ink? There's a lot more ink in a reinker than there is in a pad. They usually cost about the same. Pads are very convenient to uh, organize, though, and to visually see rather than you know pulling out a bunch of bottles of ink and you know laying them all out. Pads are convenient for that, but 
uh, I don't know, maybe a good combination would be to have some pads of some things and some you just have the reinker for. Especially if you use a lot of that color, if you anticipate using a lot of the, a certain color. You know, just uh, maybe consider just getting the reinker of it. And, uh, you know, if it comes down to more pads, more colors, or um, in pad and the reinker, you know, maybe go for uh, you know, a wider range of uh, colors to work with. Okay, you can see that kind of which is starting to come around. You see that nice glow? That kind of little bit of the greenish tinge in there is kind of interesting. It kind of gives it that kind of, I don't know, there's kind of a weird tinge to that. It kind of goes along with the theme here. It's kind of a weird looking um, kind of thematic component to this uh, scene for sure. There, there isn't really any meaning to it. I just want to create something that looks kind of interesting. Okay, this is the black I was looking for. I don't have any distress ink that's going to be dark enough for where I need to take this. But uh, here we go. There's a dark brown right here. Kind of looks a little bit black on the video, but here's the black right here. You see a little bit of a difference here. Dark brown Marvy, okay. Like something like a sepia would be good in here too, okay. Lawnmower outside, pausing. Alright. <laughs> Gonna have to pause again here as the weed, uh, or as the, those blower, leaf blowers, uh, I come through a little bit after the lawn mower. Let me get a few uh, more applications in here. It's kind of easier to apply things, I think, when it's kind of moist and you know, it's not dry yet. So, especially in the darker tones, so I like to keep this moving. Now we do add on quite a few layers of ink here, and when I say that it's you know moist to the touch, I'm not saying that you know I mean this is. You know, it's not wet or anything like that, but what happens is the pulp of the paper starts to kind of achieve a certain degree of saturation. And so that when you apply the ink, you know, if the pulp is a little bit saturated, okay, um, the ink isn't absorbed into the paper as fast, and thus it's easier to kind of spread your inks out and to apply them, okay? I've let this set up here for about five minutes, and, and it, there is a little bit of a difference, you know. So we're not talking about a long drying time or something like that. It's not as if we were stamping, you know, applying pigment ink or something like that onto this paper. You know, it takes a long time to dry. But it does set up fairly quickly. So you're not going to have to heat set or something like that. I don't know, but you know, there's different brands. That being said, there's different brands that that are thicker in general. Okay, let me try to get a little bit of color in here. Try to vary these clouds a little bit. Okay, you can also you can mask off like this, and you know, apply some things like that. You know, if you want to, just for some a little bit of variation. You know, than just having, you know, just a smooth um, application thing in here. I think I'll add um, some kind of texture down here in the middle here. I think that might look interesting. I think I have the perfect stamp for that. All right, that was dark brown. Um, let's go in with black now, okay? All right, I tell you what. Here's a. I think I forgot to use this, or I pulled it out. I didn't, you know, don't have to use it. But this is Potter's clay memento. So there's a dark brown on this tip right here. Let me just stamp some of it off, and let's take a look at this one. You know, it might add a kind of an element of uh, brightness in here in terms of the intensity, adding another 
orange? I don't know. We'll see. Well, you know, I can definitely see it in there. Memento inks are pretty thick, and they're really good ones for this technique in terms of uh, kind of applying your inks, you know. They're quite thick in viscosity and slippery, too, so you can really kind of blend in um, you know, a lot of colors with that. All inks work, um, dye-based inks, I mean, but the mementos are really, uh, really uh, good ones. Kind of nice glow starting to develop here and saturation. All right, let's grab that black. And this black will be a really the color to kind of blend in the, the different images. Okay, I stamp out my clouds in black, so uh, the color that I stamp out the darkest imagery in is often the one that kind of really brings things together in the end. Okay. It's going on very gently. The you know the page is pretty saturated with ink here, so it's not applying. This is just black right here on a white piece of paper. But when I apply it down here, because the you know the page is fairly wet, it's not transferring to my paper so quickly. So I'm not getting a bunch of you know hard oval shapes, you know black oval shapes or something like that. But even if I do, you know, go like something like this, okay? So you see that right there? You can just kind of blend it right in. That's why using kind of a lot of ink, you know, especially with your first couple colors, you know, to get, you know, establish that foundation, the, you know, and, and that's the, going the same for a, a matte paper. You can kind of do this technique on matte cardstock. I would recommend a cardstock, something that's still coated. Um, you know, for these smooth applications, but, um, and don't go like this, you know, to make a, you know, keep it light and touch. I just did that to make a point. Um, but more ink, so the stronger the glow and the easier the application, okay? If people get, you know, something like a you know, an unintentional mark that they don't like, um, like a hard oval shape if they're using, you know, a stylus. It's never with like the yellow or something like that. It's with the darker tones because the darker tones, you know, leave a stronger mark, okay? So just use enough of the lighter ones and you won't have that. Now, should you run into a situation where you do, you know, get uh, an unintentional mark, there's oval shapes everywhere, there's this type of thing going on. Don't try to just blend it out with that, you know, darker tone, okay? Go back to your lighter tones and kind of work it up to it, you know, decrease the contrast between these shapes and the background, okay? And the reason I say that, sometimes people get an oval shape. Oh my gosh, I got an oval shape like that. And then they go like this. I gotta blend it in. So they add 20 more taps, and that oval shape now has become much darker, you know. Just kind of lightly blend in. Or go back to your lighter tones and uh, bring in the background up 
closer in value to that shape that you don't want and it becomes more subdued and harder to see because you've obscured it. Side. If that gets any darker, I'm going to pause this. blower is not a good sound effect for a stamping video, so I'm going to pause here. Okay, I'm back after about a half an hour or so. Now this scene is very, very dry. Well, maybe not completely, but mostly, so... I'll just have to use a little bit more touch, you know. I could just give it a kind of a slathering of uh, the lightest color just right over the top again. It wouldn't really change the uh, kind of the spirit of it, you know, because it's as dark as it's going to get using, you know, an existing color. But the bulb of the paper would get a little bit more moist and it would be easier to apply these darker tones in a much more uh, kind of smooth, kind of... Uh, varied fashion, you know, in terms of, you know, going for this kind of streak. But, like I said, if I just kind of use a little bit of a lighter touch, it works out just fine. Okay? Which is kind of the process you should be using anyway. Okay. So bringing this in, I did take the opportunity to <laughs> finally clean out my, uh, stack of, uh, stylus tools here, you know. They look stained, but, you know, they're clean for the most part. There might be a little bit of ink left in some of them, but um, not so much that it would bleed out into, uh, you know, whatever color of ink or hue I choose to use with them. Okay, one of the benefits, though, of allowing this to dry is that I can get kind of a darker um, tinge, you know, value of this black, because it's absorbing into my paper more. All right, now, one of the things that I'm looking at right in here is I want this bottom part to match that top part a little bit more. So let's do go into more of this, let's use some more of this orange here, and I think I have, yeah. Okay, here's, here's, a, here's a couple different oranges. They look pretty much the same, but this one's orange, and this one's called terracotta. It's just a darker orange. Um, all right, I didn't clean out the, that tip right there here, so benefits to cleaning your tips once in a while. Um, it looks completely black, but that's not going to bleed out. Let me use some of this orange down here. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. It is, it's pretty bright, and my pad is fairly juicy, so... Let me try to get that transition a little bit more. And it's super juicy because this tip right here is really wet from the cleaning that I did. So let me get some of that moisture out a little bit more. Okay. Ooh, that orange is super juicy. I probably re-inked it. I don't use that color too much, so... It's really applying very quickly in a very dark incarnation of it too, so. But see, it's giving me that kind of orangish, orangish tinge 
down here, which matches the top part a little bit more. Not that they have to match. You can do blue down here and a different color up there, especially with this type of kind of weird theme, you know, where, you know, kind of traditional lighting and reflected light um, conventions don't necessarily have to apply. It could be more kind of science fiction-y looking. All right, now let's go up here. Let's try to blend this into some of this Milky Way as well. Okay. It's influencing it. What it looks like when it dries, I don't know. So a lot of times these certain combinations or certain brands of dye-based inks dry kind of a little bit duller. They dry lighter than what they look when freshly applied. You can spray CLEs, like with Krylon or something like that, and it will bring back that kind of wet, freshly applied ink look to it, just in terms of, you know, getting it darker and more saturated, but just doing nothing to it. It often looks a little bit more anemic. That's why I always recommend, um, you know, if you like that kind of saturated look to use um, some kind of spray sealant. It kind of protects everything as well, but, uh, you know, the biggest uh, kind of uh, benefit of it is, is the kind of the saturation and the deep kind of vibrancy that you can achieve from uh, doing that. All right, so anyway, now like so, yeah, bring a little bit down here maybe too. This was the terracotta, by the way, I switched inks. And that looks about right as far as my foundation color scheme, okay? A little bit darker on the edges here, just to create a little bit more of a strong, or a stronger vignette. Four corners. And maybe a little bit more in here too. If you've watched my video on easy lighting schemes, you'll see it applied here. I usually say that there's some area lighter in the sky and somewhere lighter down below and separated by a kind of a darker band. But if you can see here, it's kind of lighter here and lighter here and lighter here. So there's just two bands because this is a larger piece of paper. Okay, hmm. I should have grabbed my other stamp. Let me grab, I have a, this cracked earth stamp it's called. I'm going to stamp it down in this area. Okay, here's the cracked earth. The smaller one might fit in here a little bit easier, but um, I'm not going to be worried about this. I'll just go for kind of a, well, I was gonna say subtle impression of it. I'll, I'll go for a little bit of a darker one using the dark brown. I'll just use the top portion of this one. All right, now I am going to stamp right over the top of those hands, so I will need to do a little bit of masking on here. All right, so I'm just going to cover that hand about like so. If some of this gets into the hand, I'm not gonna really worry about it. And if it leaves a little bit of a, you know, after I stamp it out, it's going to leave that kind of halo effect around it. I'm not worried about that either. I just want to get this kind of impression down here. A general impression of it, okay? In the background. Okay, yeah. And actually, I might be stamping out a little bit of a larger section than I think thought. But, all right, so let's go like this. 
I don't know, it's just going to put something down there in terms of a texture that I think it'll, you know, this scene will benefit from, so. Yeah, that mask worked just fine. So it's that little um, kind of textured area down there. It's like a desert floor or so, I don't know, whatever surface. Okay. You can see all the colors we've used, huh? Okay, let's see now. Let's see some different things we can do in here. Okay, we can put some additional stars up there for sure. I think I'm going to pop out my compass and do some sort of uh, kind of geometric patterns and stuff like that that might be kind of interesting and let's do that first I, I think uh, I think that'll be a good uh, approach here um, oh okay here's another thing that I wanted to do I wanted to add some color into these forms so let's do that okay now another thing too um, here's a real pale blue. I just used this one yesterday, I think it was. It's a really light, super light blue. This is an alcohol, both of these are alcoholic pens, okay? Very, very light values, and I like to get, I would normally use like a, a pad form like this, like the Salvio blue or something like that, and I would tap in some colors, but these days we have these ink pens, you know, and I can just kind of go right in there and add that tone right over the top, so. Let me see if you can see a little bit of a difference in hue if I kind of add this in like so. Okay. I'm adding it in in those areas that where I've retained some of the white of the paper so it does read as blue. But sometimes I like to go for these temperature changes. I'll like to add a little bit of warmth into a cool, otherwise cool color scheme. And I like to add a little bit of cool into an otherwise, you know, totally warm color scheme just for a slight tinge, okay, of a different temperature, like that. You see that little tiny bluish, you know, areas, okay? Now we have these hands in here. I don't know. The hands could be rendered a little bit more, as well as this body form. I want to go over something kind of, uh, I don't know, different looking. Here's another pen. I could, this one's a shuttle art one. It's a little bit of darker blue. Yeah, that one might be too dark. I don't want that dark of a blue. I want something more subtle. Uh, this one's the Azure. Okay, Azure. Eh, that might match that blue a little bit more. Okay, combination of these two. <laughs> Let me try this one. I'll add this on this character. It's kind of a... It's like the nervous system of a... <laughs> you know, this figure or something. Or the, uh... Well, I guess it's not the nervous system, it's the, uh... Oh, I, I forgot. It's kind of coming to me right now. Cir circulatory? Yeah. I don't remember some of that's in biology. You can put that in the notes section below. I've, uh, it's not coming to mind right now. But adding that in there, it's kind of weird. Yeah, but this scene's kind of supposed to be a little bit more weird looking in theme. Okay, yeah, so adding that down there. A little bit of cool temp. Oh, that would be good in this one too, I think. Purple. You know, purple-ish. Some salvia blue. I'm kind of not doing it around everything in there.
I always liked visiting places like, um, I don't know, uh, science centers, museums of uh, industry, things like that. I used to be uh, in an uh, exposition park in Los Angeles, now it's the California Science Center. But I don't know if they have like, <laughs> and back when, there was a lot of old exhibits that they probably wouldn't do anymore, you know, like body parts and like skulls and things like that, you know. Might scare kids, but anyways, this is going in and rendering things. If you have kind of a, you know, rendered um, volumes within your scenes, okay? If you have other imagery like these in there, it's kind of good to match that degree of um, rendering of form, you know, certain, certain things look somewhat um, like more like volumes. They're more three-dimensional because they you define them with the use of shade and things like that. So it's a good thing to do everything that way, even if you're using outlined images or especially linear images, okay? These ones have, you know, values in them, but for the most part, they're kind of outlines. So it's, you know, you need we need to render these a little bit more um, in terms of, uh, you know, more fuller volumes so that they look more three-dimensional so it matches the rest of the uh, scene in that way it's more lit you should I should say okay so adding this down these hands putting some of those hands in some shadows I'm just kind of adding this darker tone this is an alcohol ink pen and then what I'll do is I'll just go back in with a lighter version of that same hue and I'll just kind of blend that in a little bit more, okay? You can use a blender pen too, but I, I just use um, lighter versions of a given hue. You know, to spread that ink around. Yeah. And I'll use, I don't know, just different values of it, different, uh, you can play around with different hues, you know, um, variations on a given hue, warmer ones, cooler ones, whatever, you can use gray, whatever. It's better than just using one, I think, you know, because in any given form, you'll see just different values within it. Like my hands right here, and yeah, it's not just one value of it. Oops, was I working off scene? If I was, sorry about that. Okay, let's try. pinkish value right here, pinkish hue, I should say. Okay, so here's these little cracks on this earth, I can just kind of go in and reiterate that. You know, a little bit of tone as well. I'm bring some of it up here in this floating figure. Bring some of it into your clouds if you want to. These are really light values, so, you know what I mean? <laughs> it really gives you kind of a, a nice opportunity to go in and, you know, blend in some additional forms or values and hue and colors. Okay. All right, now you can see where I've kind of laid down those inks. You can, you know, where I've, <laughs> like, if it catches the light, you can see that alcohol ink laid down, you know, in certain areas. There it goes, right there. See that right over here? But then, you know, it just looks like that. And then if you spray seal it, it'll blend everything in with each other. 
All right, let's see here. I think I used lightning or something like that before. I can't remember uh, in my first levitation uh, version. Let's use a lot of um, pigment. Okay, I forgot. I almost forgot. Let's use. Let me get my compass. The universal, um, universal media holder or something like that for these company compasses. I, I think these are called compound compass. I'm forgetting these, this terminology, but it has this little thing that comes out of here, you know, on one side. And if you ever get one of these things, this, that's the type of compass you want. These compasses, I don't know, back in the day, were super inexpensive, and they kind of still are. Uh, maybe, they, I don't know, maybe they're more expensive these days. I doubt if people are using them as much, you know, with computers. But anyways, this is the universal adapter right here. And that, I don't know, that was like a couple bucks. I've been using this one since, I don't know. 83, something like that. So they last forever. All right, that moves in, and this thing kind of moves in and out. I'm trying to get that to focus in there. See this little thing? There's this little dial here, and this little thing moves in and out, depending on what you want to put in here. This is one of these compass things. Where you go like this, and it moves in and out faster, okay? put it on the other side because my pen will be coming up here. All right, so I really love doing things with this, um, with my white gel pens. All right, let me see here. I think I'm going to create some kind of center, I don't know, sphere here like these hands are. It kind of creates kind of this relationship between this figure in these hands down here. I have to find the center of this too, so. Um, let's see. This is a five and a half inch. So four and a quarter will be, I mean, uh, two and three quarters will be somewhere right here, okay. Just put a little white dot there with my gel pen. And I want it to find here, I'm gonna to have to put this in here. Like so. Yeah, I'm trying to move this up. I hardly ever use these, but I have to use them quite a bit over the years. Um, okay, I'm going to find the edge of this paper, okay, so that'll reach that side, that'll reach that side, and the hands, okay, so where do I want to put this all? Like so, I want to, I want to put this line right, right in these hands, like it's kind of conjuring or something, or it's doing this thing with this levitation, levitating figure right here. So we'll create this kind of sphere type of a situation. Okay, so go like, like so. Well, I'll have to go around a couple times here. Oops, I bumped it. It's all right. <laughs> I have to get that. I have to get that uh, thing flowing a little bit more here. Okay. When it's going on this glossy cardstock, it's it's just so slick. I need to get the you know the the ball point of this flowing um, once in a while.
a little bit of that alcohol ink might be kind of rolling into my roller ball here too as I go over it so I kind of have to roll it out of it so I just go on a scratch piece of paper and I just kind of roll like that get it flowing again All right, so we have our figure there. See, it's I kind of put it behind some of these thumbs and in front of the other fingers just so it looks a little bit more dimensional. And, I don't know, I think it kind of looks semi-interesting, hopefully. As far as uh, some sort of theme. All right, I can't find that. Okay, that's where I had that dot down below there. Let's find the center up here. What if I go right here again? Almost. Okay. <laughs> what I'm looking for is if I can kind of create this. Another um, sphere that looks somewhat related to the uh, the rest of the composition. So this is just, I just lucked out here, I think. So if I go here, okay, I found the center of this top of the sphere, and if I put this right here, oh my gosh, it's almost go, it almost goes exactly to the top of this one right here. I'm gonna have to bring it in slightly. I see. Okay, and I'll create this other sphere down here. I think. All right. this. I'm not sure if I'll go into that other sphere or not. Hmm, okay, that's what it looks like right there. It's like different regions of the, uh, the spheres. I could continue this down, it would create kind of this eye opening, but I think it would interfere with that, so I think I'm just going to leave it like that. <laughs> It looks like we're looking into these other worlds, I think, you know, when, when you do, like, put these kind of two-dimensional lines, like, overlays, you know, right over the tops of our scenes. I love it in things like, um, like the Milky Way, and, you know, you can do these kind of spheres up there, or this line, like this graph, and it could look like a timeline or something like that, you know, for the, uh, like, phases of the moon or stars or something like that. Okay, now I like to kind of create a little bit of a, I don't know, kind of a, a situation on these lines that look a little bit more related to the back of the scene. So, okay, I'll show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do put these little dots on this line. I think it looks like dew or something like that. Or it could be something, you know, like a gravitational field. I don't know. I just think it looks interesting. It, it just, I don't know, it breaks up that line a little bit, the monotony of the line by doing things like this. And I have different colors of pens, like gel pens too. We can put different colors. We, you know, you can put a dial on it, but I don't think I'm going to do that for this scene. You know, in terms of like little marks on it. It could be like a clock. You can do a clock out of this, you know, and put little um, numeral 
holes on it or something of that sort. That would be kind of fun too. It's like little, these little things are kind of like orbiting around it like that. some of these a little bit larger than others. I think I have a really large one and have little small ones next to it. Maybe those are like the moons of uh, you know those figures there or something of that sort. When you add these little things like that, um, it looks like there's more going on in the scene than, than probably what really is. But it, it kind of looks like it though, you know, just in terms of some kind of graphical, you know, kind of statement. All right, let's go into our sky and reiterate some of these um, stars that we had up here that we've lost by layering um, overall all these different colors. Okay, so I'm just going in here and adding these stars in this section. Maybe I'll do it where it, there's stars up here in this section up here, but it ends right down here. I won't have any of this texture, maybe. So it looks like spatially um, two different um, areas to represent whatever it might represent. We'll leave it to the, uh, the viewer. See, so kind of spatially, it kind of looks like a different area now, doesn't it? Than that part down there. Okay, now we've gone in here with um, variations of orange and brown and um, yellow. Well, these gel pens come in so many different colors these days and I have a set of uh, pens. This one is also shuttle art that I found online. I don't have any kind of association with these um, manufacturers by the way. Um, but um, I bought a set of these and there's 180 colors with 180 refills that I bought for $20. So pens quite aren't quite as opaque, okay, is that like a uniball Signo pen, but I don't know, 180 colors for $20, 
plus 180, you know, one refill for each one of those colors is is not a bad price. Or maybe I, maybe it was $25. Did I, did I say $25 or did I just say $20? In other words, very inexpensive. Now, I when I first started using these, I, I could see, oh, these are kind of, they were a little bit more watery than, um, you know, the brands that I was used to using, all right? But I assumed that that was the case because um, that was this company's solution to these not clogging, okay? They're just thinner inks. The thinner inks, so therefore they're not as opaque, all right? But I'm good with that at that price, you know? And as long as these things work, that's, you know, what's important to me. I don't want to get, you know, gel pen that after a while it just clogs up, you know, or just doesn't flow, you know, which is the case with so many gel pens back in the day. A lot of people, uh, you know, scared them away from really looking into replacing those dried pens that they had, you know, back when. But, you know, I haven't tried these out, you know, for too long. I bought maybe these about a year or two ago, or I think it's been over a year. I haven't even used a lot of these yet. Okay, now this one, oh, this one's not even going. It has that, <laughs> I was wondering why it wasn't flowing. It's because it had that little rubber tip on there because I haven't used it at all. Let me see on this black piece of paper. So brand new, you gotta, you know, you gotta get it flowing, all right? So the, I don't know, there's so many colors, I haven't even used a lot of them yet. So see, you know, brand new. These are all looking pretty good. And the ones that I've already opened, you know, I haven't had any clogging issues with any of those either, so. Um, there's a lot of uh, brands online um, that you can find and um, you know, a lot of this comes from overseas, so I'm just assuming that there's probably one manufacturer that's making, you know, a lot of the pens for different manufacturers. You know, they're more branders than they are manufacturers, though. This is green. Remember I had the little tinge of green in that, uh, um, what, what color was I using? I forgot what it was. Um, but, so I'm adding this little bit of green into this just for a little bit of variation. Kind of, you know, doesn't that look like, I don't know, a little bit of deeper space, you know, with layers of, uh, Uh, star, stars, and starlight. Kind of like that. Um, let me see, I have a Uniball Signo Gold here. I used to like those kind of more painty ones. I don't know if I have that pen still anymore. So gold certainly relates to this color scheme, so I can add some of these up here as well. Gold touches um, those Wink of Stella brushes too. You can kind of, you know, dab around in there and add a little bit of a metallic into your composition as well, and that's really fun. See look at that space up there. Right. Those gel pens are a lot of fun. So we've kind of established <clears throat> with the use of the uh, Milky Way stamp that texture, and there's layers of colors in there, of course. And this is a way to go back in and add more texture and uh, stars and whatnot. I mean, it really makes that for you know a really full 
area up there. And the colors that I'm using are kind of within the theme of the color scheme, so it's fun to utilize our, our media that we have, you know, in kind of different ways within the same piece and really utilize um, what we've collected there as far as uh, different types of media and use it in the same piece for continuity. Okay, so we have our hands down here doing a little bit of conjuring or whatever of this form back in here. Um, let's add some highlights to some of these clouds, you know. They're a bit top lit, so I'll add a little bit of uh, highlights on the tops of some of these clouds. Instead of, you know, these little dots representing um, stars like they are up here, they're just representing lighting and um, uh, reflected light. I added on the tops of the billows up here. Okay. Yeah, something like that. That's how it's on the top sides of those billows over here, you know. I, I don't know. I, I didn't flip the clouds because I wasn't thinking about this right here, but I, don't know, I can kind of top light the lit, light these as well. It would be good if I stamp those clouds, you know, turning upside down in here so that they'd be bottom lit, you know, for the, you know, uh, lighting, but. I don't know, I didn't do that, so I'll just go with the top lighting here. Okay. Let's do something around these hands. Maybe these hands might be kind of, you know, magical or something, so I'll put a little bit of a... So we'll magical, you know, kind of um, lighting coming from those hands. Uh, so I'll kind of have a little bit more closer to the hands, like down here, okay? In the light, and then as I move away from it, I'll kind of um, dissipate that lighting by putting more space in between the dots. Something like that, see that on that one side? And we'll do, we'll do the same over here. These white dots don't really stand out too much, you know, right in here because it's so light. But I would add some down there just to kind of get it going, then, you know, kind of create a little bit more of a separation between those dots as it dissipates. That makes it a little bit more exciting, I think, down in this region. It kind of gives it some of a movement down below, like that. I 
maybe not your typical stampscape scene, but stampscapes can be used for anything. I could I could remove this character, these hands, stamp site Lakeside Cove in here, and suddenly it would become, you know, just your I don't know, a warm tinged summer night or something like that at the lake. So you can do this kind of technique around anything. This character could be out of there and those hands gone. It could say something like, um, you know, you could put a quote stamp in there about, about the stars or something like that. And it would be certainly work. So you can do anything you want, um, you know, with this uh, technique here and uh, kind of just, you know, the imagery that you use as far as the focal points, you know, kind of, you know, creates the, uh, you know, the theme of the, of the piece as far as your content goes, okay? Now, this is some Hero Hues um, pigment ink, white pigment ink, okay? And any white pigment ink will be fine, you know, your color box frost white or whatever. Okay, I'm going to backlight this character in here where I can because I there's some area that still has the white of the uh, page. So I'm putting this white light kind of coming from the back and working its way out. It kind of um, obscures the... Um, the lines of this figure as well. Okay. So we have the light coming through the armpit or whatever. I mean, we don't have to do that everywhere. I would kind of oscillate. I think it looks good to have it kind of varied. But when you do this, you kind of envelop your figures or objects, you know, rocks, lakes, grass, whatever it might be, trees in light. So you're kind of bathing these things in light is what you're almost doing in a way. And of course it's not really light, it's just contrast, okay? So you see that texture now. It's kind of enveloped in that light coming from in there. Now let's add this down to, into our clouds and we'll kind of illuminate the top sides of some of these clouds, kind of where I put that, um, the, uh, those highlights, those gel pen highlights, okay? So, don't do the whole area, just do the top portions of things, okay? That will kind of turn your objects and make them look a little bit more dimensional, saying that, you know, certain parts of them are treated differently, you know? So there's a lighter area to them. It's like my hand if I go like this, you know. <laughs> I'm being lit from all over, but you know, the top sides of them are lighter and the bottom sides are a little bit darker. And here's my finger right here. It's a little bit darker on that side, a little bit lighter here, here. You know, because I have light coming from both sides of my table. But you just kind of vary your objects. So in other words, don't see things as just uniformly colored, you know. Kind of vary them a little bit, just in terms of individual objects as well as entire spaces, okay? So in other words, here in the sky, it's lit in some areas, darker in the others. Clouds right here, a little bit lighter here, and in the individual billowing areas, and darker on the other areas, okay? So you get a little bit of variation. And from a textural standpoint, it's kind of nice too. All right. Let's put this around the hands, okay? Let's zoom in a little bit. Put some lighting on these hands as well. Kind of creates these hands are all powerful, maybe. See, it kind of illuminates those hands, right?
Okay. Some kind of glowing hands down there. All right. Now let's bring that same texture into a couple other areas. All right. So we have a certain kinds of textures that are happening within here. Now let me do something. I, I'll keep it within this framework. Let's put, let's put kind of like these. I think I can bring this area in here to life a little bit more. So I'll do these larger kind of spheres like this. Okay. Dots. I, right now, they're just dots. Maybe we'll put more next to the figure, like it's kind of emanating from the form. I'll show you what I'm going to do here. Maybe I'll make these little dots a little bit larger. Maybe it'll look like, you know, they're kind of coming at us. I don't know. I'm not sure. We'll see what it looks like. It's supposed to look like a like a lens flare type of thing. Or that's what I'm thinking of at least. What it ends up looking like. I don't know. We'll even put some in f on the figure in front of it, you know, like they're kind of dimensional, like this is more three-dimensional. Okay, so we have those larger ones now, and they're like so. Let's go with our pigment ink here. I remove some of it so that it becomes a little bit more of a dry brush application of that given ink, and I'll just kind of lightly dab right on top of there, like so, to give a nice light application of that ink, okay? I don't want a big blob of ink, I want it, you know, to kind of build it up slowly so it kind of has that a little bit of a glow, glowing appearance to um, each one of these objects, so I want that little sphere to show through, too. You know the uh, the dot, so it has a brighter center. <clears throat> okay. All right, here we go. It's kind of uh, these spheres, you know, of light coming towards us. I don't know, we can put a couple of these up here in these space up here, but I kind of want to keep those two areas somewhat um, different in terms, you know, the textural standpoint. figure. Okay. 
All right, I think that that's about it. Um, let's add a little bit more of more texture in here on the perimeter, but we'll keep it a little bit different. Let's go with the gold pen. All right, I think that is about it. Levitation part two. Unless I've done it a third time, I don't know. Second time, this is the third one. I'm not really sure when I've done this with these hands and that figure before, but here's that latest thing that I did with those kind of those uh, Metallica, you know, gold gel pen highlights. So. They're a little bit more subtle, but see that when it catches the light, you know, they really kind of twinkle or shine, whatnot. So I put some around here too. See that right there? See how it's really dark? Because they're dark in value. Gold isn't real light, but then when it captures that light, they kind of illuminate like that. Like in these areas, they're kind of fun. So it's kind of coming out from those hands down there. See that right over here? So anyways, kind of a fun little thing here's <laughs> done sideways right here just so I can fit more of it in the screen. You can kind of see it. I'm holding it so I can kind of you know keep that glare out of there. So But anyways. Fun stuff. Yeah, I know it's a little bit weird, but I like doing weird scenes once in a while. But it's pretty much the same concept, like I was saying, you know, that I do in uh, so many scenes, you know, darker perimeters, a lot of inks layered in there to create kind of a nice glowing, deep, rich surface. And if I spray this, it'll look even deeper, you know, it'll kind of increase the saturations and whatnot. Uh, the use of the, uh, the compass here with the universal adapter. You know, to add these things in here. This universal adapter is really fantastic. It's not just for doing scenes like this, but you know, you can put in anything. You can put your Copic markers and use them to create, you know, concentric circles or patterns or whatnot, things like that. And uh, I don't know. Cool. You know, to have. Choose from because you can put. 